I'm going to invite Brianna to come. Brianna is going to read our scripture for us today. I know I just invited you to be seated a moment ago. If you're able to stand, would you stand for the reading of God's word as she reads to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 12? The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. I want to start off my message today by making a confession to you. Now, don't get worried. It's not some deep, dark sin. But I must confess to you that I am inferior. I am inferior. Hopefully that raised a bunch of questions in your mind. I just have to tell you that if there is a plumbing problem, you do not want to call me because in the area of plumbing, I am inferior. If you've got a mechanical problem with your vehicle, you don't want to call me because I am inferior. I know how to put gas in. And I do know how to change oil, which I know is a lost art nowadays. I do change the oil in one of my cars myself to save a little bit of money, but that's about it. So as far as mechanics of vehicles, I am inferior. As far as music's concerned, even though I can sing a little bit and I used to play the guitar a little bit, I am infer I'm inferior to every single one of these young people and older young people that were up here this morning. Okay, I am definitely, and, and, and I have not even ever touched a saxophone, Bruce, so definitely inferior in that area. As far as athletics, forget it. I like riding my bike, and I don't have any problem going 10, 15, 20 miles on my bike, but other than that, forget basketball, soccer, and totally and completely inferior. You say, well, Pastor, that makes sense. Those aren't any areas that you're involved with. But I want to tell you, even as a pastor, in a sense, I am inferior. Thank you. Nobody said amen. <laughs> Pastoring involves a lot of different things. You know, we most often think of preaching or teaching, but there's also administration. And depending on the size of the church, there's a lot of involvement with finances and directing and all that kind of stuff. And, and I just have to tell you that although I think I do okay with all those things, I'm still inferior. I'm not the best preacher that there is out there in the world. In fact, I probably wouldn't even come in the top two, three, four, five, depending on how you rank and rate them. So if I want to compare myself to the best preachers, I'm inferior. That'd be true for every other area, for teaching, whatever. Now, in case you guys are getting worried, please don't be concerned. I'm not feeling sorry for myself today. I'm making this point to get our minds going a certain direction for what I believe God wants to tell us today. I'm not as good of a pastor or preacher as maybe many other men or women, but I'm not feeling sorry for myself. In fact, I am perfectly happy being who I am and doing what I do, even though I may be inferior to other people in certain areas of my life. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to be the best I can be. And I, like you, probably are still struggling to do that. Every day it's a new challenge. Be the best I can be today with what I'm supposed to do today. Every sermon I prepare, I want to do the best I can, but I can't depend upon what I did last week or last month or last year. I've got to study again. I've got to pray again. I've got to work again. And sometimes I do better than others, but that's my goal. I want to be the best I can be, but I have learned to be content with what God is doing in my life. Okay, My desire is to be faithful to do what God's called me to do, no matter how that might compare to somebody else. But that still doesn't take away from the fact that I'm inferior. Now, we've all battled with feelings of inferiority. And I don't want you to spend a lot of time 
focusing on that this morning, but it probably wouldn't be too hard for you to come up with a list of areas that you're inferior in. Now, you could do like I did and pick areas that you're never involved in, and it really doesn't matter to you. You don't care that you're inferior in the area of plumbing or mechanics or anything like that, but I guarantee you there are certain areas of your life where you want to do well, but yet at times you still feel inferior. And those are some of the things that I want us to take a look at today. Two weeks ago, I started a a new brief sermon series called Building the Body. And we talked about that two weeks ago, last week, this week, and next week, we're going to wrap it all up. Building the Body. We've mentioned how Paul, in his writings in the New Testament, often used a picture of a body to describe what the church is like. And that's true of our passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I told you that there are four crucial words, not words that are used in this passage, but words that are concepts that are dealt with in this passage, four crucial words or principles or thoughts that describe the church's function, that describes its relationships, its activity in relationship to this uh, picture of the church as a body. And that's what these four sermons are. Two weeks ago, we talked about the idea of unity. Last week, we talked about the idea of diversity. And today we're going to talk about the idea of inferiority, and next week we're going to wrap it all up by talking about the idea of superiority. So today we're going to talk about inferiority, and my challenge to you, and the goal of this message, I believe, is that you would respond to this comment, be content and faithful. Be content and faithful. My opening illustration about how I'm inferior in whatever areas, I rounded it out by saying, even though that's true, I am happy with the way God created me, and I am happy with what God has called me to do, and I am happy serving right here where he's placed me. I'm content, and I'm seeking to be faithful. And I believe that God is calling each and every one of us especially in the areas where we may battle a little bit of in feelings, feelings of inferiority, to learn to be content and to be faithful to do what God has called us to do. Now, what I'm going to share with you today, the thoughts and the principles primarily have to do with our role and our involvement within the church, both the church in general, you know, Christ's body in the world and his kingdom in the world, but also within our local church here. So my thoughts and ideas are going to be Focus there, but they also could apply to many other areas of our life where we may feel inferior. Where you work, where you go to school, um, in your family, whatever the situation might be. So we're looking here at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 20. Brianna read that so very well for us a little while ago. And in the first couple of verses, we find um, the first two thoughts that we've talked about the last two weeks. Okay, let me just repeat that there. Verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. In verse 14, it says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And we spent two weeks talking about that. We, we have one body, but that body is made up of a whole bunch of different parts. And the church as a whole in this world, and our church in particular is the same way. We are one church, we are one family, but we have a lot of different individuals that are a part of that family, and we're all different. And so the last two weeks we've talked about unity, that even though we're all different, and there's a lot of things that make us different from one another, there are so many other things that are much more important that are the same primarily being our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that we're able to be in unity. And that if we want to accomplish what God has called us to do and have great relationships and um, that kind of thing, we have to continue to walk and to live in unity. So we've got to be very careful to guard that unity, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. Make sure things don't come up between us, and when they do, we take care of them. All right, that unity is so important. It's just your own personal body. If you, part of your body goes, um, it gets rebellious and says, I'm not going to do it anymore, you know? Let's say you go home and, and, and you, you sit down to eat and your right hand says, I don't feel like working today, so I'm not doing nothing. Now, if you're left-handed, you're fine because it's your right hand. But what if both of your hands say, we're done for today, All right. 
I mean, uh, we don't get to taste the food like the tongue and, you know, all the little things in the mouth, you know. And uh, so we don't, we're not interested in, in lunch. So the hand, we're just rebelling. I mean, unless you're willing to just put your face down into your plate of food and eat that way, which if we're hungry enough, we might do that. We're in trouble. Uh, silly little illustration, but if parts of our body um, stop working, we realize it immediately. We need all the parts to work together for us to function well in this world. And the same thing is true in the body of Christ. So that's unity. And that week, we encourage you to strengthen your connections, strengthen your relationships within the body of Christ. But then last week, we took the opposite. We talked about how, yes, we're all one body, but we're all different. And we need to celebrate that uniqueness, that God created each and every one of us uniquely for a unique purpose and for a unique relationship with him. And that's a good thing because we don't need everybody in the church to be an usher and nothing else gets done. We don't need a whole church, every single one of us is a preacher and nothing else gets done. You know, we all fulfill different responsibilities within the body of Christ. So we're glad for the diversity and we celebrate our uniqueness and we use the uniqueness God has given us to do what he's called us to do. So today we start kind of the second half of the series. Those are both positive things. Now we're going to deal with two negative things. And today we're dealing with the idea of um, of inferiority If we go back to our passage here Starting in verse 15 It says If the foot should say Because I'm not a hand I do not belong to the body That would not make it any less A part of the body And if the ear should say Because I'm not an eye I do not belong to the body That would not make it any less A part of the body If the whole body were an eye Where would the sense of hearing be If the whole body were an ear Where would be the sense of smell but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. This passage is in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And the letter and the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. And one of their problems was their use of spiritual gifts. The idea of spiritual gifts is that God gives us abilities that we use for his kingdom and for his work. And he gives different gifts, different abilities to different people. Some of those gifts are of a supernatural, um, uh, a supernatural, um, I'm having a hard time thinking today. Y'all pray for me, okay? <laughs> of a supernatural type. Others are not so much supernatural, just very perhaps what you would call mundane, just serving and doing simple things, administration and, and all that kind of stuff. But all the gifts are very, very important. But the Corinthians looked at the supernatural gifts, those gifts that make somebody look more spiritual, those gifts that were more obvious, those gifts that were done in public as being much more significant and important. And the people that had those gifts were more significant and important. Now, we talked in our first message about how the Corinthians had a lot of trouble with unity. They, lied, they allowed a lot of things to divide them. But they emphasized these more important, the glamorous, the visible, the vocal gifts. And then the, everybody else was discouraged. They were discouraged because they didn't have one of these kind of gifts. And so in this passage, Paul is trying to encourage those that are discouraged. He says, listen, you feel like you're inferior, but you're not. And he uses this picture of the body. He pictures this thing of the, the body parts are jealous of each other. He, he uses the foot for his example. He says, you know, the foot is not happy being a foot. The foot wishes it was a hand. I could just imagine if he had the opportunity to expand this illustration in the context of a message or a study. He could say, you know, the foot would say things like, oh, I don't want to be a foot anymore. I got to stay covered up. Sometimes I stink. I always get stepped on. You know, look at the hand. The hands can be so elegant. They can do so much more than I can do. You know, a hand can do... I mean, you know, there's, there's just... A, the fingers are longer than the toes in, in most cases. They're much more flexible. They can do so much more. And, and, and you can decorate them. You can put rings on them and, and, and all this other kind of stuff. And the foot would just be so jealous of the hand and say, I wish I was a hand instead of a foot. 
I feel inferior being afoot. And then he uses the ear feeling inferior to the eye, saying, oh, I really don't want to be an ear. I want to be an eye. I just feel so inferior. You know, I mean, just think about it. You know, they say the eyes are the windows to the soul. What are the ears windows to? Earwax. I don't know. You know. People say, oh, you have such beautiful eyes. Do people ever say, boy, you have beautiful ears? But the ear is jealous of the eye and feels inferior. I don't want to be an ear. I want to be an eye. And, and, and Paul makes the point, and we're all laughing, that's silly, that's stupid. An ear's not meant to be an eye, but an ear's just as important as an eye. Yes, you wouldn't say you have beautiful ears. You say you have beautiful eyes, but that doesn't mean the ear's not important. The inferiority. The point is that every part of the body is important even though one part doesn't like what it is. It doesn't mean it's not important, and it doesn't mean that the part they play is not important. It doesn't mean that they're insignificant or inferior. They're not any less a part of the body. And actually, they aren't inferior, even though they may feel that way. But the same is true of us in the body of Christ. I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you felt inferior in the body of Christ. You looked at someone else or, or someone with different abilities or responsibilities or maybe even someone with the same abilities you have but they're better than you are and you felt inferior. And what Paul's trying to say is that every person in the body of Christ is important. And even if we don't like the part we play, the gifts and responsibilities we've received are significantly important for the body and it doesn't make us any less a part of that body. And we are not inferior, even though we may feel that way. So what I want to talk about for a short while this morning is what's the root of this problem, and then what is the solution? So what is the root of this problem? And I would say that usually the root of this problem is the wrong attitude. The wrong attitude. And there's three different wrong attitudes that I want to share with you. We've all wrestled with them. We've all dealt with them. And hopefully, if it's something we're wrestling with now, God can begin to do a healing work in our lives and help us to get beyond that. But the first wrong attitude is this, is insignificance. A feeling of insignificance. It leads us to say, you know, I'm just not important. What I do is not important. What I'm qualified to do is not important. And then, of course, the next step is, if I'm not important, then I'm not needed. In the, in the picture that Paul paints here, he says it's like the foot saying, I'm not important compared to the hand, and therefore I'm not needed. But what, would, what, what condition would the body be in without one of its feet or without both of its feet? A tremendous handicap to have to overcome, which in the real world, in the, the natural world, many people have, but still, I guarantee you they'd rather have their natural feet than the prosthetics that they are able to use and do so well with. So there's this feeling of insignificance, and the same for the ear and the eye illustration that Paul uses. For the ear to say, I'm not as important as the eye, so I'm not important at all, I'm insignificant, I'm not needed. Again, without our ears and how they function, how difficult life can be, ears are important. And within the body of Christ, every part of the body is important. Every part is dependent on the others. When any part of the body fails, it causes physical problems. And the same thing is true within the body of Christ. You know, if our stomach would think that it's not important because... Nobody sees it. It doesn't do a whole lot of real work. It's just kind of there, and it decides to stop doing what it does. The whole body would die. Every part is important. Sometimes we see this manifested in the church, in the body of Christ, with people who don't get involved because they don't think that they can really make a difference. They feel like they're insignificant. They feel like whatever they have to offer really doesn't matter. It's not important. They're not needed. But the truth is, is that in God's scheme, in God's way of doing things, every single person is important. That's the way God made it. The second wrong attitude that I think we can see demonstrated is discontentment. 
Now, these attitudes overlap a little bit. This is the idea of, well, I can do this, but I really don't want to. I'd rather do that. Yeah, sure, I can, and fill in the blank, whatever it is that you, you have gifts and abilities, or maybe whatever way you've been used before, before to do something for the kingdom of God, but I really don't want to do that. I want to do something else. Again, because of feelings of inferiority, because it doesn't have the glamour or the glory that you wish it would have. But there's this discontentment. And, and we see this in Paul's illustration. The foot is discontented. He'd rather be a hand. The ear is discontented. He'd rather be an eye. And in the same way, sometimes people don't get involved or fully invested in doing the work of God because God's having them or is asking them to do something they really don't want to do. They'd rather do something else. Or maybe they're already doing it, but they're not contented because they'd rather be doing something else. Another attitude that's very much related to this one is envy. It's similar because this discontent, but it's more focused because they not only don't want to be doing what they're doing, they would rather do something else. They see somebody else doing what they want to do, and they envy them. And they say, I don't want to do this. I want to do that. There may be some of you sitting there saying, I wish I could be up there preaching. Probably not very many because public speaking is one of the number one fears most people have. But there may be something else that somebody else is doing in the church. It's like, ah, I wish I could be doing that instead of what I'm doing now. The idea of envy. I want to do what they're doing. I want the position that they have. Again, we see that in this idea that Paul shares with the foot and the hand and the ear and the eye. Uh, I don't want to be a foot anymore. I want to be a hand. I don't want to be an ear anymore. I want to be an eye. Envy, of course, affects so many different areas of our life. When we see someone else with something we wish we had. I came across this quote this last week about envy. I really like this. It says, The only thing more disturbing than a friend with a noisy old car is a friend with a quiet new one. Because we get envious. <laughs> Sometimes we get envious of people in the church. We don't get involved because someone else has got the position that we wish we could have. A lot of these all come back to that same idea of feeling inferior, feeling insignificant. What I am doing, what God has called me to do, what God has enabled me to do, just doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. In my mind, anyway. And we've got to get beyond that because that's not God's perspective. I can tell you as the pastor of this church, that's not my perspective. I know that over the years, I've said many, many, many times, I am so thankful for all the people who call this church their home and are involved in so many ways. From those ways that seem much more obvious and perhaps public like leadership or teaching or preaching to those that may not be as obvious or as public as serving behind the scenes to do all the little things that need to be done in the serving and the fixing of meals and the cleaning of things and the fixing of things every single part is important and I recognize that and I appreciate that because I'll tell you what I wouldn't want to as a pastor have to do everything that has to be done around here I couldn't. I couldn't. So what's the solution? Let me give you a couple thoughts about the solution. First of all, don't cut yourself off. Because of feelings of inferiority or insignificance, just don't say, well, you know what? Because that's the case, I'm just not going to worry about doing anything. What I have to offer, what I can do, what I've done in the past, it's not that big a deal. So I'm just not going to do anything. To go back to Paul's picture of the church as a body. <laughs> if the foot were to say, I'm not important, so I'm going to disattach myself from the body. Major, major problems, both for the foot and for the body. What's going to happen to that foot if it becomes unattached to the body? It's going to die, right? And then obviously you have all the problems that would come from a body missing one of his feet. And that's true for any part of the body. Don't cut yourself off. It hurts the body, and it causes that body part to die. So what can we do if we battle these feelings of insignificance or these feelings of inferiority as we think about our place within God's kingdom? Number one 
is recognize your significance. I've already referred to that several times this morning. Recognize your significance. As we said last week, God created you uniquely. And he created you to have a unique relationship with him. And he created you uniquely for a purpose. He has things that he wants to use you and only you to do. And that can change over time. And that can change throughout your lifetime. But there are things that he has in his plan that you and only you can do. So recognize your significance. Know that you are important to the kingdom of God. Know that you're important to the church of God. Know that you're important to this church. If this church is your home church, if this is your body, if this is your family, you are important to us. Now, don't get caught up in pride. And if you already are, we need to deal with that. That's next week's message. Superiority. Those that feel like they're better than everybody else because they've got the gifts and abilities and all that kind of stuff. But know that you are significant. Can I tell you that recognizing your significance is the foundation for contentment and faithfulness. I told you what I believe that God wanted us to, wanted to do in this message. It's a very simple message, and it's not like it's uh, revolutionary, life-changing like many messages might could be. It's just we need to learn to be content, and we need to learn to just be faithful where God puts us and where he wants us. And the, the first step to that is recognize your significance. Again, going back to Paul's illustration, the, 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 the feet feel so insignificant, but yet they're so important. The ears feel insignificant compared to the eyes, but they're just as important. In fact, Paul says as part of what, he, what, what he's communicating here is that, listen, you've got to realize that God is the one who puts you where you are. And we need to reconcile to that. Who we are, the abilities we have, the gifts we have, God's the one that was in control of that. And if he puts you there, it's important. You know, even when you go through God's word, there are so many simple, seemingly unimportant things or people that God used tremendously. I mean, we could just go through it. We could make a big, long list, but just a couple of them. I think of Moses' staff. It was just a piece of wood. But yet God used it in Moses' hands to deliver his people from slavery. That staff turned into a snake and became a staff again. That staff was wielded to cause the Red Sea to split. That staff was used to strike a rock to bring water to thirsty people. It was just a piece of wood. I think of when Jesus was teaching and there were 5,000 men present, which means there were probably 5,000 women and a bunch of kids, maybe up to 15, 20,000 people. And it says that he taught for a long time and they didn't have any food. And the disciples said, Jesus, we got to send these guys home. They're going to starve. He says, you feed them. They said, we don't have enough money to buy food. He says, what do you have? And they said, well, this little boy brought his lunchbox. You know, a couple loaves of bread, a couple fish which that doesn't mean like loaves of bread that we buy at the store that are real big. We're talking about little biscuit size loaves of bread and probably little sardines or something. I don't know. Not much as one little boy's lunch, but look what Jesus did with that. I think of people. I think of David. It's this great stories of David. Now, he, he, did a, he, he did some things that were really bad. He was really repentant, and God really forgave him. But he accomplished so much. But he was the last of, I think, seven sons. And they just stuck him out in the field to take care of the sheep because they didn't think he was that significant. In fact, when the prophet came to town to have dinner with them, they didn't even think he was important enough to call him home to eat with them. They said the prophet must be more, must be more concerned about or more interested in meeting all the older boys. But David was the one that God called God has this great habit of taking things that seem so insignificant and so inconsequential and doing something phenomenal with them. So can I tell you that if you actually feel inferior, if you handle that right, you're in a really good position to be used phenomenally by God. Sometimes people that feel superior, we'll talk about that next week, they shut off being used by God because God doesn't work through people who are full of pride in most cases. So recognize your significance. You know, sometimes I talk to people, many times, maybe toward the end of their life, where 
they don't have the physical strength they used to have and even the abilities they once had they can't continue to use those because of limitations physical whatever type of limitations and it's like have I come to the end of my usefulness for the kingdom of God and I tell you what my answer is always no I believe God always has more for us and very probably more significant things for us than ever before you see if nothing else we can pray and seek God and if nothing else we can encourage other people and those are two of the most significant things anybody can do in the kingdom of God I tell you what I think if God has left us on this earth he's not done with us yet because when he's done with us he'll take us home don't fall into the trap of believing the enemy's lie that you have nothing of real value to offer in service to God recognize your significance the second thing is learn to be content and this applies to every area of life but right now we're talking about our position our place our responsibility in the kingdom of God but I'll tell you what we just need to learn to be content we live in a culture and a society that feeds our flesh that even from the beginning of time is don't be content I, I, I did some research on contentment I came across a lot of great quotes on contentment let me read you a couple of quotes about content this is an Arabian proverb it says it's better to have a handful of dried dates and contentment therewith than to own the gate of peacocks and be kicked in the eye by a broody camel that doesn't sound like something you want to put on a plaque and hang on your wall I just thought that was funny that's why I wanted to read that one but some other more serious uh, quotes about contentment if you are not satisfied with what you have you will never be satisfied with what you want it's better to want what you have than to have what you want. Contentment is not receiving what you want, but realizing how much you already have. Here's an old Jewish proverb. It says, if life isn't the way you like it, then like it the way it is. That's deep. Simple, but deep. And I like this one. This looks like it from the other perspective. If you don't get everything you want, think of all the things you don't get that you don't want. You can be at least thankful for that, right? We need to learn to be contented. We need to be contented with where we, with, well, well, you know, first of all, we need to be contented with how God made us, you know, and the gifts he's given us and the abilities we have and the resources we have and the strength and the energy and where he's placed us. We need to be contented with that. You know, Paul was writing to the Philippians in Philippians chapter four, verses 11 to 13, and he's thanking them for an offering they sent to him. Uh, appropriately so and he says you know thank you so much for sending the offering this church had sent him offerings on a regular basis but as he traveled around sometimes it was hard for them to know where he was and it took a while for him to get the offering and this had been one of those times he says you know the, I, I finally received what you sent and I'm really grateful for that but he goes on to say this in verses 11 to 13 but it's not that I'm speaking of being in need or is he saying, I'm not just thankful for it because, man, I had this terrible need and what was I going to do? He says, because I've learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He says the key to contentment in every area of life is to look to God and say, God, you've put me in this situation. If you're allowing me to be here, then I'm going to be satisfied with that. Whether it's because I have everything I think I want to need or I am lacking in some area. God, if I'm lacking in some area and I'm doing everything I can and I'm still, then God, you must have a reason for that and you'll take care of it in your time. We need to learn to be contented. And that applies to our position within the body of Christ. We have the abilities we have. If we're using them for him, even if we feel insignificant, even if we feel inferior, just continue to be faithful to do what God's called you to do and be content knowing that God's got you in that place and in that position for the time being. He may change it down the road. In fact, many times he will. But learn to be content. Now, sometimes people use the idea of contentment to keep from improving themselves. What I mean by that is that, well, I'm doing this little bit and that's good enough. 
So we've got to be open to that idea. God, am I doing all that you want me to do? You know, it's an excuse to not have to do more because I'm contented. You know, I'm fine. I know I've got the ability to do this, but I'm happy doing what, I've got, what I'm doing right now. But we need to learn to be content with what God has for us right now. The third thing is serve faithfully where God puts you. Serve faithfully where God puts you. This is especially helpful when we find ourselves in a situation we'd rather be somewhere else and maybe it's another step up, maybe it's another step down the road. Serve faithfully where God puts you because we see over and over again in Scripture and we see over and over again in real life that as people serve faithfully where God puts them that many times God promotes them. God moves them on. God puts them in a different situation. Jesus said in Luke 16, verses 10 to 12, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Now, without digging too deeply into that, what that's saying is that God will entrust you with some things and you be faithful with that and then God will move you on to greater things. But if God can't trust you with the little things, why should he give you something more? If God can't trust you with simple things, why should he give you something more complicated? If God can't trust you with earthly things, why should he give you more responsibility in spiritual things? So be faithful where God puts you. And this is true of ministry, but it's also true of finances, relationships, just about every other area of life. I remember when I was in college, my last year, my senior year, um, I got a new job. Um, the first three years I worked in the cafeteria, but then I got married. And once I got married, I couldn't work in the cafeteria anymore. And uh, that's because only single students could work in the cafeteria because married students aren't supposed to eat there. So anyway, so I got a job on the grounds crew. All right, we took care of the property of the college and that involved a lot of grass cutting because there was a lot of grass and I remember when I started out with the job and we go out to cut the grass and I used a push mower and this is back in the days when they didn't have that little lever you pull and it just goes and you just got to walk behind it I mean this is push mowing this is you push it mows all right say <laughs> push but, I mean, this is a big college campus, a lot of different environments for grass. So they had a lot of, we had a fleet of about 16, 17 push mowers. And uh, after lunch, we'd all come in, we'd clock in, and they'd load mowers up in the back of pickup trucks, and they'd go all over the campus and unload, and everybody would be just push mowing. But they also had a couple of riding lawnmowers for some of the bigger areas, only two or three. Guess who got to ride those? The ones that were faithful in the push mowing. The ones who were responsible, the ones who did a good job with the push mowing, all right? You had to kind of work your way up just like any other job. They also had one tractor with a kind of a big, the, you know, the platform mower on the back that they used to, to cut the, the, the football field, or the, bat, the, the softball field, you know, all the big giant fields. And, and guess who got to drive that? The person who'd serve faithfully with the push mower and then the riding mower and they demonstrated responsibility and all that kind of stuff and 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 so you know usually the person had been there the longest and had done well well i remember one time i'd gotten beyond the push mower and i was able to ride one of the riding mowers sometimes sometimes and i and i was riding the riding mower one time and and there was this guy who was a new hire he had just gotten hired and um and I'm riding along, and he's pushing over here on the side here, and, and he kind of flagged me down. We're just talking for a minute. He says, I'm just so afraid. I want to be on the riding mower. I don't need to be doing this push mowing stuff. And, and, he's, and I said, well, you know, just keep doing this. Eventually, you'll be on the ride. And he just was griping and complaining, and he was so unhappy doing the push mowing. He, he felt like he deserved to be on a riding mower. And, 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 and I looked over his shoulder, and his push mower had gone down the hill and into the pond. It was on the, this really tall hill. It was really long way down. <laughs> I didn't say anything to him. I thought, you don't need to be moved up to a higher level of responsibility. Your push mower just went, you know. And so they fished it out, and they had to tear the whole thing totally apart, clean everything, put it all back together. And, but anyway, it just shows when you're faithful with a little, then you can be trusted with more. And if you can't be trusted with a little, you can't be trusted with more. 
Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 25, and you can read it later. You may be familiar with it, about a man who owns a lot of land and money and all that kind of stuff. He's getting ready to go on a journey, and he calls in three of his trusted servants. And he says, listen, I'm going to leave you guys in charge. And it says he gives to one ten talents. And this isn't talking about abilities, although it certainly fits that idea. This is a, 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 a weight of gold, a lot of money. He's giving a lot of money. He says, you take care. He's going to be gone for a while. He says, you take and you administer this. You, you invest it. You make use of it. Uh, do what you feel is best for my interest while I'm gone. And he gives another one five talents. And he gives another one one talent. He goes away. And the one with ten talents invests that ten talents and puts it to use for the benefit of his master. And by the time his master comes back, he's made another ten talents. He's got twenty talents by the time his master comes back. The guy that had five did the same thing. He's got ten when his master comes back. The one that had one, the one that had the least, the one that probably felt insignificant, the one that felt inferior, why did the master only give me one when he gave that guy ten? He gave that guy five. It says that he hid it away. Didn't do anything with it. And then when the master came back and asked for an accounting, the one who had 10 and he made 10 more, he said that phrase that we've heard many times and we'd like to hear one day when we stand before God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. So now I'm going to give you responsibility for more. Enter into the joy of your master. And it's interesting that when you read the story, the master says that to the guy that made 10 from 10, and he says the exact same thing word for word to the guy who had five and made five more. You see, the master wasn't just pleased that he had 10 more and not as pleased because he only had five more with the other. He was pleased because they both made the same effort for his benefit, and he was pleased with that. But he called the guy who had the one and he just hid it away and he says well give me an accounting he says well he and, and the guy kind of talked bad about him it probably wasn't true what he said he says well i know you're a kind of a hard master and you're gonna hold an accounting and stuff i was afraid i was gonna lose it so i just hid it away and so here it is and he says you know if nothing else you could have at least lent it out and gotten some interest on it to paraphrase what he said and that servant was punished. That was a service definitely the servant definitely didn't receive any reward because he didn't do anything with what he had been giving. There's a couple of things I want to point out here. The servants were rewarded with greater responsibility and honor when they were faithful with what they had already been given. And like I said, the reward was the same, whether they'd been given a large amount and made a large amount, or they were given a medium amount and only made a medium amount, but they were faithful with what they were given, and so they were rewarded. And you know what? I can look back in my life and see that happening over and over again. Can I tell you that back when we first started in ministry a long time ago, back in the early 80s, I never would have dreamed that I would be pastor of a church like this. If you'd have told me this that back then, I'd be like, that, that'll never happen. It just amazes me, and I thank God for that. There have been so many other times in my life that I've been given opportunities and responsibilities. Doors have opened up that's like, I never dreamed that would have happened. And I honestly believe because I, I certainly have not done things perfectly at all, but all along the way, I've just tried to be faithful. And I've just tried to do what I could with what I'd had, and then God opened up. Other, and I guarantee you, many of you could come across examples like that too, where you were faithful in little things that you didn't think was that big of a deal. But because you were faithful and you did what you were supposed to do and you did it to the best of your ability, a door opened up that you were able to step through. Can I tell you, that's the way God works. But also from this story, we see it's the one who had the least responsibility that disappoint, disappointed his master and he was punished for that dis unfaithfulness he didn't do anything with what he had because see, here's here's the point the issue isn't what you don't have whether you're talking about abilities resources money time the issue is not what you don't have but what are you doing with what you do have what are you doing with you what you do have so as we wrap this up, I just want to tell you, everybody who calls, we're speaking today specifically about our church family, about our church body, although these principles apply wherever you go, whatever you do, if you're part of another church, applies to a lot of other areas, other areas of life. 
But if this is your church home, I want to tell you something. You are important to the life and the health of our church. And you are important to the ability that we have to accomplish God's work in this community. We need each person serving in their place. Both those that are really obvious and those that are behind the scenes. If everybody was a teacher, who would serve? If everyone was one who serves, who would teach? And how would we grow? But it says each person does their part. That God's work is accomplished and done well. And his plans are carried out. You know what I said earlier when I first started this message about my attitude? Not that I have a perfect attitude, but what I was expressing to you is the attitude we all need to have. We need to be happy with who we are and who God created us to be. Doing what we can do, wanting to do more if God opens the door, wanting to be better if we can be better, wanting to improve if we can improve. But not allowing feelings of inferiority or insignificant to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. To have a goal to be the best that we can be, but to be content with what God's doing in our life right now until he opens up another door and to be faithful to do what he's called us to do, what we can do until another opportunity is there that God leads us into, no matter how that compares to other people. You know, there's some things that we all need to do. It's clear in scripture. If we know God, we need to be people of prayer. We need to be people that love, love God and love others. We need to be those who would encourage people that God would bring into our path. We need to all give. We need to all serve. But there are certain things that God has specifically gifted and prepared you to do that you need to do. And most all of you have figured that out. You're all, many, many, many of you are serving in various places. Maybe some of you haven't totally figured that out. And if you need some help, you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. But I can tell you that God has something. If he hasn't taken you home yet, he's got something significant. You may think it's insignificant. You may feel inferior, but it's not. You're not. He's got something significant for you to do. And it's important to the body of Christ and to God's work in this world. Let's all stand together. Heavenly Father, as we stand here today, in your presence, most of us are a part of this church. I know we've got some guests with us today, and that's wonderful. Some actually go to church somewhere else. I pray you'd use this message to stir their hearts for their involvement where they are from. But God, I just pray for our church. Lord, I thank you for this church, Lord. It, it really does just blow me away that, that you would give me the privilege of pastoring this group of people in this place at this time. And God, I pray you'd help us. I pray that you would help us to be the best we can be, to do the best we can do of what you want us to do. God, we need your wisdom. We need your guidance. We need your power. We need your help. But God, I pray that you would give us the privilege of making a tremendous difference in this community. And Lord, even without looking outside of our doors, I pray, dear God, that you would help us as a church to make a tremendous difference in the lives of every single person that walks through these doors. I pray you'd help each of us to grow and learn and develop into that person you created us to be. Help us, Lord God, to be there for each other. As we're talking about the body, to support one another, to encourage one another. Lord, in light of today's message, I pray that we, none of us would ever do or say anything to try to make somebody else feel inferior. I pray, Lord God, that you would help those of us, especially in leadership, to be really good at recognizing the gifts and abilities and service of everyone and let them know how much we appreciate it. God, I thank you for all the people you've given to this church and have placed in leadership. I thank you, Lord, for all the people who serve in so many ways. I thank you, Lord, for all the different ministries that are able to function because there are so many people that says, I want to find my place and I want to do what God wants me to do. I thank you especially for people that are willing to serve behind the scenes who very seldom get any kind of recognition or glory or, or stand out in any way, but they're willing to serve in those areas because they because they're just willing to do it. Whether they realize they're important or not, they're willing to do it. Thank you, Lord. 
God, I pray for those today that maybe feel inferior, feel insignificant. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to realize how much you love them and how much you want to use them. Guide us and lead us into the places you have for us, Lord. And help us to be a strong body. Father, we thank you and we praise you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.